Welcome to the Dirt on the Past, the museum edition, a YouTube and podcast program of the Extreme History Project, which explores ancient and historical topics relating to artifact collections from the Museum of the Rockies right here in Bozeman, Montana. At Extreme History, we explore the good, the bad, and the ugly about our human past because, let's face it, history isn't pretty. But it's so important to know because it's at the very thing that has led us to the most critical concerns in the present. So join me, Nancy Mahoney, and me, Crystal Alegria, as we talk to archaeologists and historians who have been digging in the dirt, and in the archives, and in museum collections to uncover fascinating histories that are relevant to today's issues and can help us move forward with a deeper understanding of the past. Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we are the co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week, we're at the Museum of the Rockies E.L. Wigand Digital Learning Studio with guest Ashley Hall. Yay! (laughs) Ashley Hall's usually behind the scenes. Um, And we have her in front of the camera this time, and we get to ask her so many interesting questions. So we are collaborating with the Museum of the Rockies, located in Bozeman, Montana, to bring you this new version of the podcast called The Dirt on the Past Museum Edition. We're joined today by Ashley, who is the Museum of Rockies Outreach program manager who helps us record the podcast most weeks, which she's also doing this week. And she's also our guest. So that's a lot going on over there. Thank you for having me. Yeah. (laughs) We thought it would be nice for you all to meet Ashley and learn more about what she does at the Museum of the Rockies as a science educator and beyond. So welcome. Thank you. Yay. We're so excited. You're here with us. It's nice to be in front of the camera sometimes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Instead of just peeking in from the side. (laughs) Whenever we, yeah, whenever we reference Ashley now in the future, this is Ashley. <laughs> now you all know all about her. Yeah. Um, and she always looks like this. Um, <laughs> rain or shine any day of the week. Perfect makeup, perfect hair, <laughs> always elegant. Um, and on top of that, she's super smart. So this Thank is going to be fun. And that's why we wanted to talk to you today, Ashley, because yes. of all the amazing things that you do. Yeah. yeah. So we've got quite a little intro Thank here you. to go through. So I'm okay. going to say all of it because there's so many interesting things. I should have cut this bio down No, for you. no, I like it um, as it is because okay. it, it tells all the various things that I think give um, potential students ideas about what yeah, they can do, that's okay? True. That's true. So we're gonna start out. Ashley is a dynamic paleontologist, naturalist, and museum educator. Originally from South Bend, Indiana, she grew up loving dinosaurs from an early age and was inspired by holiday trips to Chicago's Field Museum. I've been there many times and also very inspired. And she then pursued a career in natural history. Ashley earned her Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology, yay, Yay. with a focus on (laughs) zoo art. I know we both. Yes, yes, I know. Yeah, I know. That's why we like each other. I know. (laughs) Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology with a focus in zoo archaeology from Indiana University of Bloomington. After graduation, she spent nearly a decade working as a science educator for various educational institutions in Southern California, including the Los Angeles Zoo and Botanical Gardens, Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, and the La Brea Tar Pits. Wow, that's super cool. So during this time, Ashley also served as the Assistant Curator of Paleontology at the Raymond M. Alf Museum of Paleontology in Claremont, California. While at the Alf, she managed the fossil collection and participated in fieldwork, including late Cretaceous dinosaur excavations at the Grand State National Monument in Utah and Miocene Mammal Reconnaissance Paleontology in the Mojave Desert's Rainbow Basin. Ashley relocated to Ohio. How could you leave those beautiful places? Um, uh, Yeah. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yep. Um, So relocating to Ohio where she worked as a naturalist for the Cleveland Metro Parks Reservation System before taking a position with the Cleveland Museum of Natural History as the adult programs coordinator. When Ashley is not educating the public in person, she is an active science communicator on social media. Ashley has presented several invited workshops on communicating science through social media at professional scientific meetings, including the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology and the Association for Materials and Methods in Paleontology, those annual conferences. Her scientific research has focused on 
sauropod claw morphology and function, which I'm very excited to hear about. Yeah. And the evolution of birds from deposits at the La Brea tar pits in her free time. How do you have any? <laughs> Ashley loves hiking, rock climbing, visiting museums, and spending time with her husband and two cats. All right. So we've got a lot to dig into yeah. there, Ashley. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, exciting. I'm this is a different kind of digging. Because, yes. Um, you know, a We're lot digging of into your mind. Yeah. I know. <laughs> like people always get archaeology and paleontology yes, confused. Always. Right. Maybe with you guys as well. Oh, oh like, sure. I asked if you dig dinosaurs. All yes. the time. Okay. All yeah. the time. I should well, have my shirt that says, I do not dig dinosaurs. Yes. I yes. have one. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can get a yeah. picture of it. Yeah. yeah. And then we can give you one and you can cross out the yeah. not. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh my God. And, and that's a great thing to bring up, Ashley, right yeah. off the right at the get-go, because as anthropologists, Nancy and I are yeah. archaeologists, we get, you know. People will come up to us and talk to us all the time about dinosaurs. And we don't, we we must have these very blank looks because we well sometimes they come things. with what they think is a, a dinosaur bone or a fossil. Oh, and Tana, sure. and we'll say, well, yeah. we're an ar archaeologist. Yeah, but don't you know what this is? And I'm like, yeah, I could make something up, but no. Um, so I always yeah. say, well, archaeologists do human. Um, yeah. studies and and paleontologists do dinosaurs everything studies. right yeah. paleoanthropology yeah. Yeah. is so, the closest we get yeah so way far back to human ancestors those fossils yeah but, there's right. archaeology there's paleontology and then there's paleoanthropology which is like the marriage of both of them yes yeah. and where we get to play together sometimes mm -hmm. so, i know i know which we might have a little crossover in this conversation today yeah so, absolutely so, so um ashley your bio mentions that of course you love dinosaurs dinosaurs you mm -hmm. of all things paleontology really from an early age yeah. you had that passion right from the get-go and so can you tell me a little bit about what piqued your interest as a young child in dinosaurs yeah. and this the um, paleontology and all those ancient creatures yeah and then can you tell me a little bit about um your connection to the field museum or yes. to a museum and if that fostered your love <laughs> even more Oh, I As love this so much. This yeah. museum today, I know. So. You you can't tell that I'm a museum person, can you? I think we've said on previous episodes that I designed the studio, but um truly this is what my brain looks like, I always say. That's awesome. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, as a kid, actually, so I was inspired by dinosaur toys, as most people, you know, most kids are, I think. Um, dinosaur toys are one of those things that's a tangible mm -hmm. that is also a real thing. Like, it's a real animal based in, you know, evolution and science in the world. It's uh, it's not like, you know, teddy bears are great, but it's like they don't live in the wild. You know, right. they're based on bears, but dinosaurs are actually like the gateway to science is what, you know, many of us always say. And so it's, um, you know, my interest was piqued very much by dinosaur toys and then going to the library my mom um was a huge advocate of just going to the library and going to look for books about dinosaurs bringing them home I mean what a great resource and, yeah. and to date myself a little bit we were checking out VHS tapes as well oh I know <laughs> so, right do you remember the first time it really clicked for you that at one point there were dinosaurs walking all over the earth before there were humans and that they don't walk the earth really now in the forms that we see them yeah. in, in museums. Do you remember like what that was like getting your mind around that? I think, you know, part of that had to be, so there were, uh, there were VHS tapes that actually Museum of the Rockies had produced. Oh, wow. Well, so weird. That's right? the full circle. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Jack Horner was a huge inspiration mm. for me as a kid because I was born in 1984 and going to the library, we had VHS tapes and a lot of them were dinosaur digs, like actually showing Jack Horner up at Egg Mountain digging up Mayasaura. And so for years, what seems like millions of years, I have admired Jack's work and, and was inspired by him. And so it was a little bit of everything. It was a little bit of um, dinosaur toys, library books, uh, being exposed to real paleontologists who were actively working and digging stuff out of the ground. And that sort of essence of discovery, the draw of like the curiosity that you get when you're 
you know, seeing something for the first time that, you know, no other human has, like that's right. really powerful for kids mm-hmm. to see. You, you know, could about. go out to the world and discover something yeah. that hasn't been seen. And yeah. it's, it's that bridge too. It's, there's something there. And I know psychology uh, has, you know, different psychologists have done different studies on kids and You've probably seen recently on the internet where it's like, kids who study dinosaurs are smarter or whatever. That meme was going around for a little bit based on research, but um, it's pretty cool that you can take something that's like a dinosaur toy and then (laughs) connect it immediately with the earth. Like kids have an immediate connection. Like insects are like this too, right? Kids like bugs. And so, you know, kids go and find bugs outside. They can learn about them, study them up close. And so these like, you know, simple dinosaur toys and like insects and things like that are very like powerful um I don't know just things that kids can have ownership over it is it's like that first level of inquiry it's a model of something else exactly yeah Uh, I don't know if there's like a is there an art well I mean so I was inspired too by Indiana Jones um I mean who wasn't I don't know right right. Uh, (laughs) and so that's really what made me pursue uh anthropology as well but um you know, as a kid going into the Field Museum of Natural History, which was like an hour and a half away, um, shout out to the Field Museum. I always like tag them on social media in all of my posts and stuff whenever I talk about them, because honestly, if it weren't for museums, um, libraries would have been my my kind of way into the field, I think. Um, but being exposed to a dinosaur that is towering above you right and yes. going into an egyptian pyramid yes. where you can see all of the artifacts and mummies um and beautiful pieces it's that you know tangible, it's that tangible link to these things that you can yeah. you can reach out and touch it or you can visually just see it right in front of you yeah and that's what the museum has that the library really doesn't yeah right so nice. right it's yeah. very powerful yeah. for me it was um we would have field trips into the museum of natural history in new york city mm-hmm. that would be the big field trip in and you get to go to those and then my parents always like to go to the met and so there would be a lot of egyptian and yes. wonderful archaeology stuff in there aside from the art and then all of the amazing things in the Museum of Natural History. And it is it is so strange to stand in front of a full T-Rex the first time you see one and how big they are in the teeny tiny arms, which yes. are <laughs> fascinating. And I, I still don't feel like I fully understand that. I know, I know. Um, and so going on from that, so, so you have all that inspiration and then you went to school and you studied this and you followed through. It wasn't yeah. a disappointment. Um, and it led you to to do research and do um, what you do today. So can you tell us a little bit about your research interests in paleontology yeah. and then especially about the sauropod feet? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Because I, I read a little bit and I'm like, what? <laughs> So I brought some visuals oh, yeah, and okay. for our podcast listeners, maybe a reminder that this is a uh, a visual thing as well. Yeah, so yeah. if you're not seeing it, you can go on to um, YouTube, YouTube yep. and see it. And yeah. then you can see the, the, the visuals, the images, yeah. the images and the um, everything we're going to talk about here okay. in the next minute. Hang on momentarily. Okay. We yes. have to cut this part because I have to go. Well, okay. you know what? We don't have to cut it because I want to say something too. Okay. okay. Is that um, kind of going back to Ashley, what you were talking about with the field music museum. Museums are just so important. And you, Nancy, with the museum in New York. And I have a museum that I came in right now. Right. So I right. grew up not far from here. And so this museum was really an important place for me, Um, not as much for the dinosaurs, but for the archaeological collections that they had. And that is where I really learned to have a love for history and archaeology is from this museum. So I just wanted to do a shout out. Wow. Just do a shout out to this museum. Capture, I think like it's so powerful to hear like people's, you know. Yes. How it's influenced that what the spark is. Yeah. Yeah with the university and in this town because there's not that many there's small ones scattered around montana yeah. but we're lucky to have this one which is so big so lucky. hold so much yeah. yeah so let's jump to i brought some slides Yay. um and it's a talk that i've sort of i've sort of piecemealed together a few of my favorite slides because um i have a very like i don't know if anyone has an, a traditional way through i mean i think it's more common now to sort of like find a weird wacky path into what you're doing because Mm -hmm. who has a normal pathway I don't know (laughs) exactly um and so hopefully this works what's happening there we go 
There we go. There we go. Aha. Uh-huh. Wonderful. Okay. So uh this is oh we have to maybe you can edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here is uh me as a oh, little my kid. Goodness. So um right. speaking of like a spark moment, this wow. is Chicago um when Dynamation came through, which was like uh animatronic dinosaurs and oh, yeah. um, very cool. this was a va- I'm so happy my parents captured this photo because you can see my face and just how excited I am. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um my favorite dinosaur is Parasaurolophus right there and that's, that's actually what we're looking at. That's yeah. a crazy okay. head. Wow. It is. Okay. Is there a bone that goes back in yeah. there? It's not just cartilage. No, right? it's a full uh What is the purpose of that? Great question. So it's actually for sound. Uh, and so okay. it's uh hollow tubes that the animal was to push air up through its head and it came back down and made a sound similar to like a french horn wow, so that's fantastic and then here oh, is a uh a t-rex oh, there my goodness. look at you <laughs> oh <laughs> and uh that's my brother there next to me so wow. you know thanks to my parents who um sparked my interest in paleontology i just you know i found it from a very young age and just never gave it up like a lot of kids yeah so, right that's right. great so my research uh, on sauropod feet. Um, so uh, my primary job is to be a science educator and communicator, but I do dabble in research from time to time. I'm not an academic. I don't teach in a university, but I teach um, kids in museums and also adults. And so it's important to me that I keep my mind and my um, my interest in research. So I'm always reading scientific papers, keeping up on literature because as science communicators, we actually take that information and distill it for kids and so, and the public. So uh, one of my research um, uh, interests has been sauropod feet, and this is a sauropod leg. So if you don't know what a sauropod is, the long neck dinosaurs that are so classic. So the Jurassic Park Brachiosaurus uh, is a good example, and so these animals. Here, a sauropod yeah. then is like a class of dinosaurs. Yes. It's not just one kind of right. species, because I don't know my level yeah. of distinction. Okay, so, so a, a, a brachiosaurus is a type of sauropod. Exactly. Fantastic. So brachiosaurus, apatosaurus. Um, Are they all very large? Right from. Past. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're all really big. There are some small ones. There's okay. actually a few dwarf species, but um, and are they um uh primarily plant eaters or mm-hmm. herbivores? Okay. Yep. Every single one we found is a plant eater. I'm sure at some point one swallowed a bug or something. But because your your little model here has tiny teeth, so yeah. it just occurred to me that we're not seeing flesh eating teeth right. on the sky. So true to. True to form. True to form. Good. Yes. So they are long necked animals that have uh, four pillars as legs and this very long tail. This is actually a model of a sauropod baby that uh, is from an exhibit that the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles created. Mm -hmm. And what I really love pointing out about this, this is the true like sauropod body form. So any sauropod you see is going to look like this with a little bit of variation. Um, the cool thing about this is you can kind of see there's little spots here. Um, these spots and scales were actually found on the embryos of some dinosaurs in Patagonia. Wow. So you can touch this and actually feel. Yeah, it's um, got a rough, bumpy kind of yeah. surface. Yeah. yeah. So scales, oh, is that yeah. common beyond sauropods? So scales, yeah. So scales and feathers are typically. Scales or feathers mm-hmm. and feathers. Can you have both on the same animal? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So just like a chicken where you have the sort of oh, tail legs yes. and then sure. the feathers. Sure. Um, a lot of dinosaurs like Velociraptor, T-Rex may have had a little bit of both. Okay. So a sort of, there are long neck dinosaurs that have these big pillar like legs. And at the end of these legs, they have feet and their feet on the front. So think about your, your front arms, but down on the ground. So the front feet um, or manis have uh, variations of claws. So they have a a giant claw that you can see there on the front foot. So imagine your thumb. Okay. That would be this animal's uh, same digit. The one with the claw. Yep. So digit one. And then on the feet, they have a bunch of claws. And most sauropods have at least two on their back feet, um, if not more, mostly three with like maybe a fourth 
Um, and then the little tiny uh, toe back there doesn't have any claw, but they have these massive claws. Wow. And so when you look at sauropod claws across uh, various different groups of sauropods, you can kind of see that the front feet have, and the front feet is going to be the top slide there. The front feet have a big claw on the thumb, and some of them don't even have digits or phalanges at all. So for a a pistacillicaudia right here on the end, I'll mouse over it. So you get here um, some big, you know, digit one claws, yes. big digit one claws in Camarasaurus, Apatosaurus. And then once you get to Brachiosaurus, these phalanges start actually going away. More like toes <laughs> or what? So imagine if, if our, um, for example, like if we have our hand, mm -hmm. so that's what they're their front feet would be like mm -hmm. but if you just walked on your metacarpals okay, okay. <laughs> and then you had little claws coming out of your right no there, no right? no claws. Okay. not at all okay. so then on this one oh, a piece of celicadia they I evolve got... away yeah. their fingers wow wow there's no fingers there it's just yeah. metacarpals it's just so like these knuckles where we have yep. knuckles okay that's it they just yeah. they just didn't grow them after that or some of them it just became an evolutionary yeah and so they have the appendix or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Most of them have okay. like the thumb claw and okay. then they walk on their metacarpals. Oh, interesting. Um, but the back yeah. feet, which is cool. That's my, my specialization is you have a uh, sort of an early sauropod foot here with four digits. You know, most tetrapod animals started out with five digits and then you go down and as they evolve, they get these really big claws here on their back feet. So our question was um, kind of proposed as a, a counter hypothesis to a hypothesis that had been put out there, which was, um, do sauropods use their claws to get stuck out from mud? Okay. okay. Which is a weird yeah. thing to talk about, right? But right. Like, when you think about uh, these big animals that are walking around, you know, you have these- They're so heavy. Multi, you know, hundred ton animals. And when they're walking along, if they get post hold, uh, one colleague of ours said, well, they may use their claws to help unmire them. Like maybe okay. they're using their claws that way. Mm. So we took to looking into it because we said challenge accepted. Let's look into see uh, right. if yeah. that's true at all. And so with paleontology, we have a bunch of analogs that we use because uh, birds and reptiles are their closest living relatives. So that would be phylogenetic bracketing and trying to figure out what those similar animals do in those situations with those similar features. Hmm. So the top row here, A, B, and C, those are tortoise feet. Okay. And tortoises are a really good um, sort of animal to look at when you're looking at these feet because birds have a very different type of foot, um, very highly modified. They're not quite there. Alligators are aquatic. Like it just doesn't really make yeah. sense. But when you look at a tortoise foot, it looks pretty darn similar. So the bottom row, A, B, and C here, uh, these show uh, sauropod feet. So they're not so different. Yeah. And I should say, too, that sauropods have um, always been compared to elephants. Right. And so... Because they're big, heavy with these pillar... Like, I was thinking about exactly. that. And, and the way these yeah. toes are on the model here... Yeah. Um, I felt like we were almost seeing something that looked like what I think of as elephant toes. So yeah. I was curious as to what you were going to say, because elephants don't have claws. Really? Yeah, really? some animals have claws, but right. And so when we when we look at similar animals, we're not looking at elephants because they're mammals. I mean, we we they're farther of, away in terms yeah. of relatedness. OK, uh, evolutionary yep. history and such. And so. They are compared most to elephants, which is incorrect because elephants are mammals. They have very flat feet. So figure A here is uh, the bottom of an elephant's foot that I, I drew. This was our um, wow. right that foot drawings, drawings of those. And they'll, do, yeah. they'll do, um if you go visit elephants. Yes. Um, we did this again on our, our year uh, of travel during my husband's sabbatical. And we had the chance to 
interact with elephants in different ways and um they could make a footprint for you they would paint and they would do stuff and that's exactly what the footprint looked like so i might have been able to guess that if that was a jeopardy question that's awesome yeah what is this thing i never guessed that i I know (laughs) and And no one would have liked you know you know as mammals they have nails and so uh their nails are made of keratin just like dinosaur claws but Claws are very different shape than an elephant toenail, which is like very flush with the foot. And so the bottom of the elephant's foot, um, we looked at a sort of uh, a similar analogy for the bottom because this is the sauropod's foot on the bottom. And you can see they have really big claws um, that are sort of wrapping around there, around the foot. But then the bottom of the foot pad is an actual pad. So we know by looking at sauropod foot bones that they had a similar pad to elephants, which is really cool. Hmm. Because you're having to support yeah. those those leg bones you showed earlier are massive and yeah. then they're supporting a massive animal. And so that's a lot of weight. And so you're distributing it over this pad. Yeah. Elephants. It's like a shock. Of it's interesting because, you know, mammals, some mammals have claws, some don't. They all have nails. But so interesting that these sauropods... And are there differences in the front and back with the tortoise in the same way you were finding with sauropods? Yes. Um, yeah. So there's there's a little bit of a similarity there too. And then figure C here is uh, a desert tortoise's foot. This was actually a tortoise I worked with at the museum in uh, LA. And you can see there there's claws on the end of their foot. And then they also have these big scales on their feet for traction and sort of helping okay. grip. And elephants, because you know, skin kind of breaks and scars. It has a very similar scaly like texture on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they all kind of share a little bit of similarity there. Um, So what we looked at was sauropod foot function. So when they are uh, flexing their foot, what does that look like? Because if you're going to be trying to get yourself out of mud and there's sauropod trackways across the world preserved beautifully in different places, especially if you looked at um, for our research, we looked at uh, various trackways that sauropods had been stuck in that was a very like wet substrate so like Mm -hmm. mudstones um kind of gloppy wet you know not like volcanic ash like when we're looking at australopithecine footprints um in i don't think we had any in africa yeah yeah so mostly mud sure um and so this image here shows the hypothesis we were trying to disprove which is like can they get themselves unmired if they get stuck Mm. we have a, a site here at the museum called the mother's day site that for many years was thought that sauropods had been mired and stuck in mud because they found a bunch of foot bones that were stuck uh and preserved in mud and Mm. it's actually out by this leg that i showed here um and so the hypothesis that we looked at you know we were looking at foot function and one thing you have to look at with tortoises and and sauropods and all animals especially of the reptilian nature is that they were egg layers. Mm. And so um, if they're not using their feet, because it's kind of weird to evolve foot claws to get yourself out of mud. Like how much is our sore? I was just going to say, <laughs> to me, it seems more like you're needing to dig for some reason yeah. and, and then digging to make a nest, which I feel like is where you're going, makes a lot more sense for yep. why you would retain them, even though you have this big body and you don't need it for mobility to move around so much yeah most of the time okay so go ahead so we're looking here so the picture on the right here is a picture of a sauropod nest Mm -hmm. and sauropod nests are not like the nests that are sitting right outside of our studio window here they're not contained in a you know nice little package they're sort of this trough and so how do you lay eggs in a trough you know it's actually like a dugout trough with with a rim and they're laying their eggs in one area and so by looking at sauropod nests we went hmm i wonder if uh this means that they were also using their their claws to dig nests and so oops let's go back here so what we had looked at then was basically that um the evidence that we had seen from trackways and with the evidence of sauropod foot flexion is that they were not getting themselves unmired, but they were actually using those claws to dig their nests with, which makes more sense evolutionarily. Because then it, also if it's a trough, you could imagine a hind leg especially 
moving. Right. At, I mean, when I, I just yeah. look at animals and the way they, when my, mm -hmm. when my little dog, every once in a while after she does her business, she scratches with her back feet yeah. and the claws kick and up it, stuff yeah. and you're like not so lots happening but yeah. you could imagine a much bigger animal right. would have that but I mean still it's amazing to me to think that you've got your head way up here way you've got this here. gigantic body you're using this back foot to make a trench and then you're hoping to aim your egg laying yeah, yeah. Like, do you turn around and then like nose it in and check it out? Because I would be like, I have no idea if I made it in the trench or not. I mean, that's the fun about paleontology. So you have this body plan, which doesn't really change across sauropods. We have like a little bit of soft tissue when it comes to their skin. Um, we have amazing bones in many collections across the world. But these animals would not fit in a building. You know, they're so enormous. And so Huge. they're they're not able to, you know, dig like it, if you dig have in all the their... neck kind of vertebrae, right? Yeah. Like they would just be a couple stories. Yeah. High. So absolutely. wow. And so they're not using their head for anything with nesting. They can't like, you know, if you put your head towards the ground and a predator is around and oh, your yeah. your head as a sauropod is only like this big. Mm. And so that head gets snapped off, you're dead. You know, That's so it. their head That's is it. way up here. Yeah. And so those big pillar like legs we hypothesize are actually digging nests like tortoises are okay, okay. yeah because yeah. yeah, they can't really turn around and see what they're doing either they're yeah. doing it in sand mostly yeah or, and so what do we like think soft substrate so do we just figure it's a similarly soft substrate for sauropods or because they have such powerful yeah. legs and claws it could have been they could move, anything yeah, harder. They anything. Could move dirt i okay. mean most likely you know in the environment they were in in the jurassic period is going to be wet and warm and humid mm. And so the things have moisture yeah. easier to, okay. I mean, not all sauropods lived in, in warm, you know, humid areas, but their legs were powerful and they could, you know, mm -hmm. carve out these nests. And they also laid their nests in like massive groups. So these mm -hmm. sauropods were nesting in, you know, like football fields wide areas. So a bunch yeah. of females mm -hmm. would nest in the same place. And then maybe, and this is a question I don't, know if if everyone knows the answer to because i'm not a paleontologist yeah um how often would they lay eggs do yeah you think? um i can't think off the top of my head what the research says about how often like if it's annually um, i don't even know how long they yeah. live for but they seem because they're so big like they would live for a long life so you wonder yeah. how many times does a a female sauropod lay eggs yeah and come back to a similar place but it seems like you have multiple females yeah. using a big area a big resource that's and yeah. fascinating do they, do they stick around or they kind of do their thing and that's what take i was off? Right. Yeah. yeah so yeah. uh sauropods are not the best parents um <laughs> sorry uh a lot of dinosaurs are you know our state dinosaur is maya sora and maya sora um you know for the research of jack horner and holly woodward and many others um, found out that Mayasaura was taking care of their babies. Uh, and Mayasaura means good mother lizard. Mm. Um, <laughs> sauropods, not so much. God love them. <laughs> they're, uh, they're huge. They nested in one area and it's basically just nesting, laying as many eggs in one area as possible, leaving and then hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. So they're like, see you later, kids. Oh, you know, good yeah. luck out there. Um, Can you say how they know the difference between who was a good mother and who wasn't? Yeah, yeah. So there's um, uh, strategies, and God, it's been a while since biology, but uh, K strategies and R strategies. Right. <laughs> laying a ton versus yeah. laying not as many. So okay. having one baby or two babies like a deer or, you know. Like rabbits or mice having lots. Yeah, yeah yeah or like a sea turtle okay. for example okay. so you either have one baby and you take care of it until it's grown up and you protect it from everything and feed it or you just have a hundred eggs and you lay them in one place and then you hope for the best yeah. right and like so it's like even. fish or, or insects or, yeah okay yeah. okay wow. all right so so the idea with some of the with our our state dinosaur yep. is that there were fewer than eggs laid and so there were there were nests that were laid that were um I mean they they also nested communally but what's interesting about the the embryos that were found was that the babies themselves didn't have the strength or uh development of their limbs to actually stand. Oh okay. And so by looking at the the bone morphology of these babies you could see that 
you know, mom and dad had to take care of them. They look more like a songbird and less like a goose or a duck okay. where geese and ducks just get up and they run around right away, right away like in right. the water, ready to go. Okay. Um, that's what these guys probably would have been like. Okay. Um, so hatch out of the egg, open their eyes. They're hiding in plants. Maybe they're fending for themselves. Whereas Mayasura was hanging out in the nest, helpless little, you know, babies being taken care of by mom and dad and protected okay. by aunts and uncles and things. Very so, interesting. Very yeah. interesting. interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, that... we could talk about that forever. I know. So, but, but. Should we move on yeah. then? Okay. And and you really did a very good example of what you do here at the Museum of the Rockies. Exactly. So you really gave us a good education on the sauropod. Now, I feel like I know so much more than I did Ooh. when we walked into this <laughs> podcast today. So thank you, Ashley. But maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what you do yeah. at the Museum of the Rockies sure. and what kind of education programs you do and what kind of education you do in this studio. Yeah. So this studio, so this was a uh, project I took on upon my hiring in 2021 and the EL Wiegand Foundation has sponsored this beautiful space. We had a grant that was uh, started by employees that were um, my direct supervisor and then people before her. And so when I started, it had uh, it had been written into my job. And so I had worked with uh, and when I heard about this project, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, I would love to design a studio. Are you kidding me? And so this is part of my job now. So I am the manager of the EL Wiegand Digital Learning Studio, which has um, classes, virtual tours, and um, other just sort of like interactions with, you know, teachers and educators across the world. So our mission at Museum of the Rockies is to bring Montana to the world and the world to Montana. And so as part of this, Montana's really darn big. I mean, we, we all know it's yeah. huge. I mean, Montana hard. to Montana should be in there uh, too. I mean, yeah, I and there's a lot going on there. We yeah. get calls from, you know, teachers and, and they really want to come here, but it's like six, seven hours sometimes. And so we say, well, instead, do you want to Zoom with us into your classroom? And we can also send you an outreach kit with uh, fossils in it or, you know, pelts or skulls. And uh, you can interact with us and take a virtual class. So right now I run our virtual classes and organize our virtual programs. And then I also um, do our outreach kits and sort of maintain and update those, uh, as well as adult programs. And as we always say, other duties as assigned. Yeah. yeah. So there's lots of different things we do in museums that... Um, we should make a whole separate podcast about because mm. uh, no one would ever believe what we do in museums. The other things yeah. museum professionals do. Yeah. That does sound like a podcast. Does, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, this is a beautiful studio. You. And it's, you know, you, you're only seeing a small part if you're watching this on YouTube, but it's just, it goes on and it's, it's there's uh, even more to see. Amazing. It's like Darwin's office in yeah. here. And so, speaking it's of. A, <laughs> okay. so i have a little uh oh, wow. room inspiration yeah. so if we cut back so there we go so my inspiration for the design of the studio was charles darwin's office at down house <laughs> fantastic and, i haven't uh, actually seen that picture before so, wow cool. yeah and so i took sort of the the essence and the inspiration from that right also emily grassley from the field museums uh show the brain scoop um, oh, fantastic. A, she's a friend of mine. And, and so I was taking notes from her set and then we made um, this set. Wonderful. Well, when and, Crystal and I saw it, we were like, we really want to record in that studio. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we were so inspired. Yeah. So that's super yeah. exciting. Yeah. yeah. So there's a awesome. little bit of inspiration from, from everybody in there. Yeah. yeah. And it's very homey too. I mean, there is that sense, like you showed a, the picture of yes. everyone's office it it you know there's a place to sit over here and so we sit and have conversations and it's just very it's a wonderful space Thanks. yeah a place yeah. to think big thoughts i'm glad yes, I, drew, yes. I drew you guys in. <laughs> absolutely awesome. um and speaking of big thoughts so you've written two children's books yeah. and crystal yeah. maybe you'll hold them up when i okay. say the title so one which is out already is fossils for kids mm -hmm. super cool a junior scientist guide to dinosaur bones ancient animals and prehistoric life on earth so that's fantastic and i feels like there's a lot in it but it's not overwhelming for a kid and what sort of age group would you recommend for so this book is ages five to twelve fantastic yeah yeah so you can you can enjoy it for a long time yeah. too. probably and get a lot more out of it one, like it's actually i wrote it 
uh, and part of this part of like science communication, right? So it's like taking all of the cool, interesting information that it swims around in our heads every day and distills it not down, but makes it accessible for people. And so in this book, it sort of acts as like a mini uh, reference book. Mm -hmm. So I've had adults who are like, you know, really enjoying it. Because I it's just yeah. little... love children's books as a way to dip into yeah. something that I need to quickly learn something about because it does, it gives you that essence. Who did you work with to yeah. bring this book to life? So this one was Callisto Media, um, was the publisher. And this was actually my COVID project. So nice. when everyone else was learning yeah. sourdough, I had been contacted <laughs> by Callisto Media to write a kid's book. So, so they reached out to yeah. you. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. Thank and you have you. another one in the works um, yes. called Prehistoric Worlds, Stomp into the Epic Lands Ruled by Dinosaurs. Yes. Great title. I'm yeah. I'm so excited because this is the first time world premiere that this has ever been announced oh yeah and it'll be out so, in march is that march right 30th. oh my march, gosh yeah. march 30th yeah. okay oh. so just in time for april fool's day presents yeah. i don't know <laughs> just get it just get it it's going to yeah. be great and will we have them here at museum of the rock yes okay. yay yeah. and is it the same publisher no it's actually dk okay okay UK. wow and, um, fancy if you're familiar mm. with dk as i was as a kid i grew up on dk uh i witnessed books oh, oh right so okay. i really, like yeah. was the inspiration for me to like dive into science and so it really has come full circle and i love dk they were wonderful to work with um they gave me full liberty on what it looked like what wow. was going in it i designed the pages like the spreads and everything they really oh, gave nice. me like full creative control and so Good. i'm so excited to get it congratulations into the of, of kids everywhere so yeah you can buy it um at the museum gift shop you can buy it on um target amazon basically under it's so exciting probably pre-order it now pre -order. on amazon mm -hmm. if you go in, in probably other places as yeah well. it's yeah beautiful it's actually um more illustrated and less wordy mm -hmm. and so it's it's got beautiful illustrations um by a woman that i worked with named claire and um I was there to help consult, uh, you know, on what these animals looked like, you know, so yeah. it's, uh, it's a little, it was a really cool relationship because, you know, as an illustrator, she didn't draw dinosaurs really ever, you know, and so I'm like, okay, well, can you make this one like this? And, the, you know sort of give a little scientific insight to that's fantastic like. oh that's so, wonderful. It, i think seeing the images brings it to life and then there is a another book that isn't about dinosaurs but that you worked on with your husband yeah and so let's show that one okay. too um it's gems for kids gems and this is also available here and this one's also out and that's super exciting because i love gems. i remember getting those <laughs> little crystal growing yes, things yes, for my yeah. kids and them being fascinated and there are these crazy places in south africa where you can go into a gigantic room and sit there and pick up as many rocks as that'll fit in this little pouch what? that you pay for you yeah, can take yeah. them home it's called oh. a scratch patch and oh. um, I used, we used to love bringing our kids there but just the way this again is um it looks like a delightful um way of explaining about gems that would would sort of have a large age range yeah. so you could start young and then still get a lot out of it and we put everything in there from like birthstones yeah. to um you know experiments to uh what is a gem you know what is a mineral and uh, my husband's background, he's the... I was just going to say, is he is he just like a gem collector? Or let's, <laughs> let's give him a full background. <laughs> oh, my husband, Lee Hall, is the uh, lab and field manager for Museum of the Rockies. And so he runs the dinosaur digs with uh, Dr. John Scanella. That's so, fantastic. fantastic. But he, he has more of a geology background than I do. Okay. So I'm more of like the biology side. I did animal behavior in school and anthropology. And then um, he did geology and... Uh, paleontology okay. that's a good that's okay. a good combo good combo a yeah. good combo so i want to continue to talk about your education and how you educate people and of course as time goes on we find different ways to do education and communication and i have to say ashley you are a social media media maven <laughs> Gosh. You do so well, and and I follow your Instagram page, oh, yeah. and I just it's just so enjoyable, and I've learned so much just from that. You so, learned about Taylor Swift. I have learned a lot about Taylor Swift. 
<laughs> but, and how she loves uh, dinosaurs, and, right? Yeah, I, don't, yeah. Don't, don't I don't know, but yeah. yeah, which is important for me because my daughter is a huge Taylor Swift oh, fan. So I can, I can like have conversations with Emily about ta- yeah. Taylor Swift based on your Instagram. Happen to be a Taylor Swift educator. <laughs> but no, you put other you put other things on there as well besides Taylor Swift. But um, but I want you just just talk about that a little yeah. bit and how you do media communication and yeah. education okay. and the importance of that. So I started I started science communication with um, uh, social media back when Instagram first started because Instagram was that you know new app where you take a picture and you post it right away. Well, when I was first working at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles County and the La Brea Tar Pits, I would see these amazing things every single day. So I'd walk by a case and there's a saber-toothed cat, or I'd be outside and there's, you know, a Gulf fritillary butterfly, or, you know, I was just like amazed by everything around. And I really just wanted to share everything that I was seeing with the world because I thought, well, if this is cool to me, it must be cool to other people. And so I started sharing um, pictures on social media paired with you know, uh, facts about them to help educate people about the stuff that I like to learn about. And so that's really how my social media started. And um, taking my educational background on talking to people in museum galleries and spaces, and then putting that online. And when I started, there was a whole movement on, you know, science communication, science Mm -hmm. communicators. It's not the first time it had happened, but it was the first time it was sort of transferred to the internet. Right. And so I jumped on this whole movement of these people, these science communicators that um, make learning fun, basically. Right. And yeah. and and understandable by the public. Yeah. Kind of, well, uh, yeah. Translating science yeah. for the public. And right. there's a big disconnect, as we all um, you know, know and feel in in the most recent years where it's like, you know, uh, science sometimes can be daunting. It can be scary. It can be intimidating um it you can know be boring it if can it's be not terribly presented boring, really right or dry. you don't know why this thing that is being shown all over the news is actually important or the ways in which it could become very yeah. important. right and yeah. when i was looking into the research behind people's mentalities around science i was seeing that you know many studies were showing that people had a big distrust in scientists and um and b- mainly because no one understood or knew the scientists and so there was this big movement to show people's faces online and to say hey i'm a scientist so am i i'm a you know uh rocket science i'm a geologist i'm a you know right. to sort of like elucidate the face of science right because mm-hmm. it's not just a white guy in a lab coat it's right. you know people of all different a backgrounds. whole range of people yeah 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 and so people could see themselves. Do you have any tips for communicating? Because Instagram, it's kind of a nice bite size where it's often a captivating image. And then I don't know how much text that you write or what you would advise for both the image part and the text part that you have felt has been a, a, yeah. a good sort of um, um, mix of what yeah. should go up. Yeah. And there is an overlap too. I think just like museums and I've worked at zoos as well, where, um, you know, if you're in a museum or a zoo and you're looking at a label, how long are you going to spend reading it? Mm -hmm. So there's a similar mentality when I'm thinking about writing something. And I see a lot of people on the online that do a huge panel, right? Like Mm -hmm. a Wikipedia amount of work, right? Right. But are, are people reading it? And we don't know those stats from just like Instagram statistics alone, Mm -hmm. but I feel like a good amount is like, you know, a paragraph or maybe a little bit more, especially if you make it interesting. Mm -hmm. And so getting yourself on social media and and being a science communicator on social media is really interesting because it gives you sort of another platform. Mm -hmm. Like I used to spend all day at, at the tar pits talking to people and giving tours, but then when you're actually sitting down and thinking about something and trying to verbalize it, it gets your brain to work in a different way. And so it was a way for me to like share and learn and get myself to become like a bit more of a writer, I guess, mm-hmm. um, because reading and writing is very different than speaking to someone, mm-hmm. you know, trying and, to engage them in that different way. You only have so many words, probably so much time yeah. that they're going to look at it. And yeah. That, yeah. It is a different skill. And, and also like accessibility ahead. issue, Yeah, you know, where it's like, are people reading? Are they listening to it? Are they watching captions? Like there's all these ways now you can engage with many different people. Mm-hmm. So 
do people ask you questions on your Instagram or not your social much media? I don't know. <laughs> I, I do a Q&A You've educated while, them all. So, but, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of science communicators out there now. And honestly, everyone's doing an amazing job. Yeah. And so there's many people that we follow online that, um, you know, if you guys put up my social media, um, I share from time to time just to get other names out there, too. Yeah. Um, and I just picked up a new gig. So I'm actually doing social media as a side hustle again. Oh, really? Um, for another podcast called Paleo Nerds. Oh, oh excellent. It's a yeah. A podcast that is uh, by Paleo Nerds for Paleo Nerds. So. Oh, wonderful. Very good. <laughs> so is, is there um, a... Twitter was something that you had listed and yeah. it's not called Twitter anymore. Since the change, since Elon Musk bought it, um, is that still a platform that you use and has it changed at all? I've actually stuck by it. Um, it's it's one of those things where, you know, paleontology and just like anthropology, they're really small worlds. Yeah. And it's one of the best ways to keep in touch with people. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the paleo community still exists on Twitter. Um, I think it's a very specialized, you know, very specific uh, I know there's a lot of biologists and stuff on there too, but yes, I am still on X okay. Okay. slash Twitter. Okay. Okay. But that's not where maybe you do the bulk of your. Yeah. The bulk big... is mainly Instagram. Okay. I would say. Interesting. And I have time and Facebook. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so we wanted to note on your CV that, um, you've also Ooh. done archeological research yeah. as we, you yeah. know, had talked about earlier that you have this background in anthropology and you co-authored a paper titled um i'm gonna butcher this the wauseon wauseon yeah wauseon clovis fluted point preform yes. from northwest ohio yeah um observations geometric morphometrics microware <laughs> and toolstone procurement distance now i know what all those things do, so i feel very <laughs> smart right now i don't um so... so talk a little bit about that how much archaeology have you done because it's it's fun when you get into sort of clovis era you're getting yeah. into some extinct mammals mammoths and and the, the larger bison um, the overlap that, right yeah. you know where those things are gone and you have people here who we know were in the Americas and hunting and they keep pushing that back, which is fascinating. Right, like yeah. 22,000 years now. Possibly, yeah. right? With the um with our podcast about the yeah. footprints at yeah. White Sands and, yeah. and some more research to back that up that came out um more recently in the last few months. So yeah, yeah tell us a little bit about yeah. that. So my um my background in in archaeology was in zooarchaeology. Mm -hmm. So looking at um the way that humans interact with animals mm -hmm. and um, it's not a subfield that I often hear about in the general public. I don't know. I mean, maybe people it's out so there. It's so important, especially in Montana, where yeah. a lot of what we have left is stone tools and um, bones, faunal remains, the bones of animals yeah. that were used by humans in some way or the remains of food. And so I think the zoo archaeology stuff there's a lot of students here who, when they would take a class with Jack Fisher as an undergrad, would get be really fascinated because yeah. you could even tell what season a bison was killed in. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. go ahead. So okay. yeah, I love it. So there's a little bit of an overlap. So growing up, I was interested in paleontology. So you're like, why is this girl in anthropology now? Well, <laughs> so long story short, I'm terrible at math. Um, was not diagnosed in time to know I had dyscalcul dyscalculia, 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 mm. I can never say it right. Number switching, like, um, oh, uh, sure. what do you call it? Dyslexia. Dyslexia. Like dyslexia, dyslexia, dyslexia but with numbers, numbers even with more numbers. so yes. than with words. Okay. And so just, when I was wow. looking at schools, um, so I'm a terrible test taker, couldn't place, uh, did terrible on the SATs, uh, did not even attempt a GRE, but I've gotten like A's and B's my whole life in school. Right. Terrible anxiety, terrible depression. Mm -hmm terrible math skills and so I got into my like third choice college which was Indiana University shout out to IU incredible Yay. school um sorry it was third choice but I wanted to go other places <laughs> <laughs> but IU Bloomington is great with anthropology and they have this incredible zooarchaeology lab and it was kind of the perfect combination of animals and sort of prehistoric-esque adjacent things and also bones which I've always been obsessed with and then I took geology on the side but I didn't go the geology route because it had 
too much math, too much chemistry. chemistry. Me too. My God. Hell. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to. I, I like the other aspects of archaeology that I could do because that was also not a strength of mine. Yeah. I'm I'm okay reading papers and understanding Same. them. But for me to do the research, um, that part of it wasn't as interesting to me. And like you, I really prefer almost the translation education sign and I do have my own ideas and do my own research but if it involves chemistry or math I'm I'm either wow. not an author or I'm way down on the list <laughs> yeah it's yeah just, it's not as comfortable I mean me. shout out to everyone who is good at yes y'all make we the need world go around. all of that we um, need all of that yeah but when I was looking at the anthropology program they had this robust zooarchaeology lab and zoo meaning like animals mm -hmm. and archaeology being archaeology right digging yep, up yeah yeah old things things yep. mm -hmm. and so I was like yeah that sounds really cool so zooarchaeology deals with people and animals so people domesticating animals people eating animals people exactly. using animals in various ways like horses and so with zooarchaeology i got interested in um bone identification yes and so i love sitting down with a pile of bones and looking at them and going okay this is a femur this is a tibia this is a radius you right. know i love getting my hands on them feeling the different, you know, uh, points and articulations. Yes. And just understanding like how these animals moved and anatomy and stuff like that. And so the research that I worked on in school was um, uh, bison subsistence strategies. So looking at bison and big North American plains animals from hunter gatherer uh, groups. So predating any modern tribes. Right. Um, that were moving and nomadic and camping and hunting animals and then having these like temporary encampments that then they would hunt, bring animals back to camp, butcher them and then, you know, discard the bones in midden piles. And so I was looking at the remains of bison and deer and rabbits and turtles and all sorts of things that people were eating um, and identifying the bones. Right. So super fun. So anyway, so the Wasian Clovis point. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's a different story. That was like an adjacent project to my research, but it was really neat because my aunt, uh, who was living in Ohio at the time, was a lot of uh, archaeology in Ohio oh, a lot of good archaeology so, archaeology, so much so yeah many. and so yeah. she was living on this property she had uh points that she had found on her property and had brought them to me at like a family dinner and um asked what they were and I took one look at this this point and I went oh Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> that, that's an important one. Clovis is so distinctive. Like, yes. Is a yes. Clovis point. Wow. And that means it's at least 14,000 years old. Um, crazy. Yep. And I never got to visit her place and she's since sold it. But basically, I um, obtained the point um, from her and I showed it to some specialists when I was working at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And sure enough, um, one of the point specialists who is, um, his name is Aaron, uh, he looked at it and said, this is a Clovis preform point, yeah. which means that it was not fluted yet. Right, it was um, on its way to being a yeah. fluted Clovis. So someone was making this beautiful, you know, big big point. Um, I don't know if you call that like a spear necessarily. Is that? Yeah, yeah. it would be more like I mean, on either a spear or an atalab. Yeah. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be on a bow and arrow because yeah. usually they're a bit too big, we think. So yeah. this, this big point still had the little nubbin at the bottom where um, a person would have eventually broken that off to make that fit on a shaft. And so it's really neat because he took a look at this point and said, you know what, this is actually kind of a an incredible transitional point like we have the ones that are fluted we have the ones that are being made but we don't mm -hmm. have many that are of this you know stage in, wow in its oh. creation wow and so uh that was a cool study. i'm sure somebody yeah. was was looking for that for a long time and didn't mean to drop it well, <laughs> right right, right. Yeah. right. Well, like, people find all these archaeological yeah. points and it's I like know. were they walking and dropped it did yeah. they throw it out of frustration or were they um, <laughs> they they um placed in a ceremonial way and, yeah. I, and there's a lot of native people yes. who talk about that that you know archaeologists will find this a point out in the middle of a field or by a creek or somewhere and you know you always wonder well why was this placed here why yeah. did someone just lose it out of their pocket well probably not probably a lot of times 
the point was used and then it was given back to the earth for um oh. in in gratitude or for other reasons and yeah. so um i think i always try to bring that up because there was a shoshone gentleman who talked about that in a workshop that we did and oh, I it's thought not that was, people are just no yeah. they're not losing especially them if they they're wouldn't perfect points that right. huh. weren't broken or anything like that because right. you find often those in um bison kill sites mm -hmm. and sure there would have been a lot that went in people didn't bother mm -hmm. to go in and retrieve those but as you said then sometimes you buy and then sometimes you find especially during the clovis period whole caches mm -hmm. of the raw material and levels of preform wow. and there'll be ochre in there too and sometimes um like in montana it's found right along a, a creek bed and things like that so what material was it obsidian was it something else do you know it what the was, material was um i believe it was flint uh from because they must have done, Gosh. it looks like from the title that yeah, they were yeah. doing mm -hmm. um, some sourcing of that too. Yeah. So that's, that's cool. cool. Because the stone type, and I can't remember because I haven't read it in so long, but the, um, the, the material that it was, was transported from a specific location. That so they, they could actually do like the geochemistry, too. which is cool. And yeah. usually for Clovis, they used very high quality materials because to make beautiful. those points yeah. you really needed something that didn't have a lot of imperfections so you see a lot of obsidian but probably very high quality yeah or flint you know, so we do in the yeah. future, i feel like we should also talk about uh a lot of times that the material that stone tools are made of has fossils in them oh yeah yeah and that's true it be are fun. Like made of petrified yeah. wood um yes. or you know yeah have crinoids in that yeah that absolutely in, in archaeological sites we often find where people have picked up fossils and then kept them and and, and they're in bundles or yep. they're in um important places within the archaeological site and so they um you know so there's a lot of different ways that people they're recognized always, as something special yeah, have yeah. Always, i love that fossils yeah. have always been special <laughs> okay. they're special well especially yeah. like the little sections of ammonites yes. that fall out yes. uh, uh -huh. buffalo stones yes yes buffalo. and that's what i'm thinking of is yeah. the buffalo stones those are cool so that's really neat well this has been such an amazing <laughs> yeah. conversation yeah. yeah um today ashley and it's been so nice to visit with you about your work and yeah. what you do and yeah. we kind of knew what you did to a certain degree but it, we it was nice to take a deeper dive and really yeah. better understand what you do yeah. here at the museum but in your in your um academic life as well yeah so. it's all sorts we could talk for days about I know we could. I know I I know you'll be on another podcast <laughs> oh um again and and that's super exciting and so go ahead yeah you tell us again where people can find the yeah. book and then also if you want to share your Instagram and Twitter or X and anything else you want to share on your website too yeah so my uh my books can be purchased wherever books are sold so um try to purchase from local booksellers if you can um, but otherwise, Amazon, Target, Barnes and Noble, etc. So that's Fossils for Kids uh, is out now. And then there it is. Uh, Prehistoric Worlds is going to be out March 30th Yay. on pre-sale now. And then also Gems for Kids is great too. And if anybody wants a signed copy, you can either find me at Museum of the Rockies or I'm happy to you or or something similar so i love personalizing the books as well yeah and then my instagram is at lady underscore naturalist and um i don't post as much as i used to but i'm certain to again so okay great yeah. wonderful thank fantastic so um well thanks ashley yeah, and thank thanks to everybody watching and listening yeah. and for joining us today um if you love the podcast and the video cast please tell a friend and make sure you subscribe especially for the podcast wherever that shows up on your feed each week and if you can leave a review um on apple Podcasts yeah, or spotify yes. please, please leave so, <laughs> yeah we need it so thanks for listening or watching us topics. today absolutely yes. <laughs> oh yes. questions yes. or future yes. topics yeah. please do that We're we would love to that some feedback and maybe we'll find a way to make it even easier to do that and we could start um delving into topics that are coming from you all and questions that you have and things like dinosaurs but uh we, we don't know anything about dinosaurs so we'll have to ask it's ashley so, cool. so that's okay <laughs> so please um you know find us again and we hope you join us next time to find out more about 
the dirt, dirt on, on the path. path. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Crystal's gonna finish us off here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. So a big thank you to the Museum of the Rockies for the use of this beautiful space that you've created, Ashley. And thanks to also the folks at Museum of the Rockies, including Chelsea Hogan, Ashley Hall, and Michael Fox. And thanks to Lawson Alegria for mixing the music. Yay! Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.